All right, Shell. This is going to be Mr. Murray trying to dump like 2,000 years worth of history right into your ears and eyes in the space of a hopefully not overly long YouTube video. I have no idea how well I'm about to succeed, so let's find out together, shall we? We'll start with ancient Rome through the Renaissance, and yeah, we'll start with ancient Rome. The map you see in front of you, this is the Roman Empire at its greatest extent. This is as far as it ever got, and when it dominated this much of the world, something like one out of every five people on the surface of the earth was subject to the authority of the Roman Empire. Now, the Roman Empire no longer exists. There's still a city of Rome. It's the biggest city and the capital of Italy. But the people who live in Italy today aren't directly descended from the Romans. The Romans as a people are, well, they're pretty much gone. But their influence lives on. Look at the letters you see on the screen. You may think those are English letters, but they're not. They're Roman letters. English, like just about every other European language, basically stole the Romans' writing system. Our system of government in the United States, we stole a whole bunch of it from the Romans, and we knew we did that while we were doing it. Our highest lawmaking body is the Senate. Rome had a Senate to make its laws. Even like small things, like I bet you all know what our national bird is, the bald eagle, right? We ripped that straight from the Romans. To the Romans, the eagle was the uh, official bird symbol of power. And instead of flags, they used to carry these long poles with little statues of eagles perched on the top, just like you've probably seen perched on top of uh, flagpoles carrying the U.S. flag. Anyway, one of the main ideas I want you to take away from this is even though the Roman Empire is gone, and it happened a long time ago. In a lot of ways, they were surprisingly advanced. We tend to think of, hey, as time goes on, things get more advanced. And since the Industrial Revolution, that's been true. But in a lot of ways, the ancient Romans were more advanced than the people who came after them. Let's take a look at some examples. By the way, special bonus, the pictures I'm using in this presentation I personally took most of these pictures. There's a couple of exceptions, like the one that you'll see me in. Well, actually, my mom took that picture. So let's take a look. This building here is the Colosseum. The Romans would have actually called it the Flavian Amphitheater, but anytime you hear people talking about it, you are going to hear them say Colosseum, so that's what I'm going to call it. At its biggest, the Colosseum, it was essentially a sports stadium in ancient Rome. At its biggest, it could hold 85,000 people. If it was still an active sports stadium today, it would be in the top 30 biggest sports stadiums in the world right now. And today, we can build with electricity, with cranes, with bulldozers, with modern tools, the Romans built this 2,000 years ago, and it's still standing. You can actually still go inside as this picture with me and my dad shows. The Romans had all sorts of shows here. They had gladiatorial combats where people fought each other with real weapons. Sometimes they'd bring in wild beasts from far away. And if stories are to be believed, you know, one thing that was surprisingly advanced about the Romans is they had actual running water 2,000 years ago. And if the, if the tales are true, they were actually able to hook up running water to this stadium, flood the center, and have full ship-on-ship -ship combats in an artificial lake they created in the middle of the Colosseum and then drain the lake so it would go back to being a regular sports stadium. Imagine any sports stadium you've been to today. We would have a hard time doing that now with all the technology we have now, and the Romans could do it 2,000 years ago. But hey, I can see you saying, well, the Colosseum, that's big, it's famous. Of course they built their big famous buildings well. 
We'll take a look at my next picture in just a sec. When I toured this part of the world, one of the coolest things I got to see was I got to go to the city of Pompeii. Now, that was kind of an average Roman city. It wasn't the sort of place that the really rich went to. It wasn't full of mansions. It was full of, you know, kind of middle-class houses. Problem for Pompeii, though, is they built their city right by a volcano named Mount Vesuvius. And one morning, Mount Vesuvius woke up very angry and sort of, well, lava the whole place. Now, this was obviously very bad if you lived in Pompeii at the time, but it's been very good for historians because lots of Roman buildings were destroyed over the years, not by wind and weather, but by people. Sometimes people smashed them just to be jerks. Sometimes they smashed them because they wanted to use the stones that had been used to build them. Anyway, because it was basically covered by lava that had hardened into rock, no one could really mess with it, so it laid underneath that hardened lava preserve for a long time. So what I'm about to show you is a picture I took of the inside of an actual regular Roman house, 2,000 years old, gets hit by lava, and this is what it looks like today. It's still good. I mean, shoot, that almost looks nicer than my house. And trust me, my house would not survive getting hit by lava. Another thing from this city, just for fun, this is the floor of one of the buildings. This, in Latin, in the Romans' language, this actually says, beware of the dog. So, a beware of the dog sign that Romans built into their floor, 2,000 years old, survived getting hit by lava and we can still look at it today. There's lots of things you can use to see like th that in a lot of ways the Romans were advanced beyond the people who came later. Literacy rates, that means how many people can actually read. In the ancient Roman world, you got 20 to 40%, which isn't great by modern standards, but the people who came right after them, you're looking at 2 to 6%. Also, Life expectancy, how long you could expect to live. If you were in the ancient Roman world, maybe, you know, 55 to 65. Once the Romans were gone, that number went down by like 15 or 20 years to maybe 40 to 50 years of life. All right. Now, I'm going to try to cram the entire history of the Roman Empire in here. It's not going to work that well, but we'll see what we can do. See that little red dot? That's Rome. Rome was founded in 500 BC. They believed it was 753 BC, but it wasn't. It was actually 500. But in addition to being great builders, they were pretty good soldiers too. So after a while, they had conquered the area around them. Then most of Italy. Then they learned to build decent boats, and they expanded and expanded and expanded and expanded and expanded. And get ready, because we're about to hit a change. See if you can spot it. Ah, we went all purple here. Before, when the map had been red, Rome had been a republic. It wasn't a full-on democracy the way we would think of one today, but they did have a senate that would vote on laws. Purple signifies when it changed into being an empire. The original emperor was a guy named Augustus. He's who the month of August is named after. Anyway, let's keep zooming through history, shall we? It gets bigger. Bigger? Okay. 117 AD, this is as big as it would ever get. It's not, a, it's not a completely downhill from here, but it will never again be this big. Because next click, you know, we're a little smaller, maybe a bit bigger, you know. <gasps> Ooh, but here, Rome just broke into three separate pieces. Lots of people thought that Rome was about to fall, but it managed to pull itself back together. Then they came up with the idea, you know, our empire is really too big. How about we split in two? The western half would be ruled from Rome. The eastern half would be ruled by a city from Constantinople. Spoilers, things are about to go badly for the western half. Badly, really badly. Rome isn't even in the empire anymore. Worse, worse. But then, go the green. The uh, Eastern Roman Empire's greatest emperor, a guy named Justinian, 
he actually reconquered a lot of the territory that had been lost, but it didn't last so well. Sometimes things will get bigger, sometimes smaller, and then eventually, oops, broke into three again, back together, and bang. That's really small. And then the end. Rome was gone. But if you've been looking at the years in the lower left-hand corner, man, Rome lasted for like 2,000 years. America hasn't even been a country for 250 years yet. So Rome lasted more than eight times as long as the United States has made it so far. So that's pretty impressive. After Rome came the Renaissance. The word Renaissance means rebirth. Remember that? You're going to need it. Rebirth. So it was actually a rebirth of knowledge that had been lost when Rome had fallen. Is Like I said, the Romans were in a lot of ways more advanced than the people who came later. And a lot of what they knew, I mean, simple things like, you know, taking a bath often was a good idea that was lost in later years. So let's see why the Renaissance happened. First off, there weren't as many workers available in Europe. Why? The Black Plague. The Black Plague was one of the worst epidemics of all time. I know we're in living in the middle of one, and the coronavirus is so bad. But man, the Black Plague was even worse. As of this morning, the coronavirus has caused more than one and a half million deaths. That is so many. If you listen to the news, you'll hear people talking about how the coronavirus is the worst health crisis in a century. They're right. The one they're talking about that was a century ago was called the Spanish flu, and it caused something like 50 million deaths. But neither of those, neither of those is up to Black Plague standards. The Black Plague as a, at the low end, might have caused 75 million deaths, or it might have been as much as 200 million deaths. And included in, the, in that is somewhere between 30 to 60% of Europe's entire population. With so many people dying off, there weren't as many workers to do work, and it created a need to figure out better, more efficient ways of doing things. But beyond that, it became easier to share information. The reason is one of the most important inventions in all of history, the printing press. The printing press made it possible to easily make lots of copies of books rather than having to do it slowly by hand or having to make specific designs for each book. This made it so much easier to create like cheaper multiple versions of books and it made books something that was available and affordable to everybody this picture of the gutenberg bible here this is from austin one of the oldest printed books in existence is right down the road from us i suggest you go see it as soon as it's safe to you know go around and there's no covid finally the fall of constantinople this was the last city of Rome. It was the final capital of the Roman Empire. And as I showed you already, by 1461, it was no more. But as the Roman Empire fell, and I was about to say disappeared from history, it didn't really disappear from history because the people who had lived there fled all throughout Europe. And with them, they brought a lot of the knowledge that Rome had that the rest of Europe had forgotten about. And when you put those factors together, there were fewer people, so you couldn't take your workers for granted. There was a new way to print books that let you spread information. And there had been a release of all this information that for so long had mostly just been known by Romans. It created the Renaissance, a period of rebirth, a period of the reawakening of art and other things that would eventually lead to the Industrial Revolution that we've already studied. But most famously, the Renaissance uh, was all about beautiful art. Most of it was either super religious Christian art or super Roman style art. I'll show you just a bit of both. 
First up, this is the Pieta. It's probably my favorite statue. This shows uh, the body of Jesus after he was taken from the cross, being held by his mother Mary. This was made by Michelangelo, the guy, not, you know, the Ninja Turtle. Obviously, this is a highly religious Christian work of art. Here's another one of my favorite statues. This is a statue of the Roman hero Aeneas. He's carrying his aged father, who's carrying their household gods, and clinging to his leg is his young son, Ulysses. They're escaping from the burning city of Troy, protected by the gods, because he would go on this series of adventures and finally make it to Italy and found the Roman people. Uh, when the Renaissance happened and people rediscovered knowledge of Rome, they would make works of art like this, remembering those old Roman stories. I've already shown you this picture right here. This is both Roman and religious. This is the Roman Emperor Constantine getting a vision in the sky and deciding that he should have his entire army fight under the uh, a Christian symbol. And finally, this. This is a room painting called The Fall of the Giants. The, if you look up at the top, that's what the ceiling looks like. If you look in the lower right-hand corner, that is a door for exiting the room. All the walls and the ceiling are covered with the picture of the gods up on Mount Olympus. If you look kind of in the top middle there, you can see Jupiter, or Zeus if you prefer his Greek name, holding lightning bolts and getting ready to throw them down at the giants that are trying to attack Mount Olympus from below. Okay, so there you go. I know that was a whole bunch of stuff. Do you remember what the word renaissance means? Hopefully you do, because the word that the Renaissance means, that is your secret word. I told you to remember it. That will be the secret word that you activate uh, today's assignment with. Thank you very much for listening. I'll see you soon. And until then, stay safe and stay healthy.